One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. And welcome to episode number eight of Talking Pictures Alliance. I am here, Kristen Ashton, with co-host Jeff Reynolds. Welcome, Jeff. How are you today? Uh, just, you know, amazing. I, I hope we have like five hours to talk about this movie. Dude, and with the response on Twitter, with everyone getting on board, there's, I think you're right. We're going to be here until sundown because today, dear listeners, if you didn't read the title already, we're talking about Lord of the Rings. The Fellowship of the Ring, 2001's mega epic fantasy tale that brings to life J.R.R. Tolkien's fantasy novel following Frodo, who's given the task of being ring bearer to bring the most evil ring ever crafted back to the fires from which it was forged, throw it in, and end the evil of the world and usher in the age of man. I guess that's not Frodo's entire purpose to usher in the age of man, but yeah, it's, it's a side effect of what goes on. Yeah, it, this film, I, I can only imagine, because I, I had read uh, Fellowship of the Ring before the movie came out. I re actually read it really early in my life. And um, as I was reading it, uh, it takes a lot of patience to get through a lot of it. And it takes a lot of uh, understanding and reading and rereading and, and doing all of this. If I was a Hollywood filmmaker, I'm not sure I would want to take on this huge project that is not only massive, but also loved by so many geeks out there and try to bring it to life for the screen because I would be nervous that I couldn't do it justice. Right, because not only is it this really compact story, but there's so much backstory that Tolkien wrote about. There's there's an entire book, The Silmarillion, that goes over the pre-pre-history that leads up to this whole ring story. Now, I'm very curious what, because you read the book before you saw it, and I I read the book long after I saw the movie, so the movie was my first experience with it. What were your thoughts going in? Were you excited? Were you scared when you saw it? Was it basically everything you hoped it would be? It was. I, I do remember. I mean, I can't, as you said, the year 2001, I'm like, my God, that was a long time ago. Um, but yes, I can remember being like blown away. Uh, you know, just there are obviously, and you know, if you go on the interwebs and you look at a bunch of stuff, there's a bunch of things that were not included in the film. Obviously, it's book to film syndrome here, but uh, the stuff that they did was just so good. And you have ideas of what these characters look like in your mind and, and all this. I personally think that the film itself holds up to the book almost perfectly in my mind. I think it's just just fantastic. Where there's a lot of times where I read the book and then I go and see the film and think, oh man, the book was so much better. But they did such a great job with this movie. The Fellowship in particular, I think, is just an outstanding film. I mean, think about it. So not only that, not only the undertakings of the story and all of the, the meat and potatoes of everything that's happening, but also the practicalities of this film, like hiring people that are normal heights to play characters that are different heights and how they had to shoot scenes a hundred times to get the right angles for the right characters. And I mean, it, it's massive. Right. And you're talking about that forced perspective, because if you watch the behind the scenes, especially with Gandalf and the Hobbits, there's a lot of forced perspective in that Gandalf is sitting feet behind um, Elijah Wood playing Frodo, but it looks like they're looking at each other in order to get that height differentiation because the hobbits are tiny people. They're, what, three to five feet high, maybe? Yeah, and you just think about, like, and then, and of course, there's Gimli, who plays, a, who is a dwarf in the film. And, like, all of these, all of these characters are different heights, and this was right at the age of, you know, computer-generated graphics coming to its height and all of this sort of thing. And they use nothing but practical effects in most scenarios where they're just doing, you know, dialogue and stuff to make this look real for 
the viewers and it's just something we don't see anymore right i mean the cgi nowadays would be used to accomplish a lot of what they accomplished in this movie but they didn't partially because it wasn't developed to where it is today but it shows and i think that once we start talking about if this lasts if this movie will stand the test of time i think that's a huge part of why it will Totally. And even compared to the second and the third film, we can really see a huge difference. And I know Smeagol had to be put in. You can't tell the Lord of the Rings without Gollum Smeagol going on. And what person really has that body type, right? So they, it's Andy Serkis in that green bodysuit and then the computer monster body over him and that that really stands out so the first one is so nice because you rarely even see Smeagol and when you you hear about him on the torture board it's a puppet hand that they use to come up and you're absolutely right so so in that case I guess we have this perfect marriage of graphics and practical effects that you see a lot in movies in this five-year time period from about 99 to 2004. I would include The Mummy in this, where when they use CGI, they use it for a purpose, and so what if it doesn't age well? It delivers something that we couldn't have seen otherwise. Absolutely. And I, I think the the point about Smeagol and Gollum, that, that whole uh, aspect of Fellowship of the Ring is what I think sets it apart from The Two Towers and Return of the King, because in those films, we start getting bigger, badder, worse, right? So uh, Two Towers, uh, you know, with the fight sequences and the giant armies that are fighting, obviously Gollum is introduced. Then in uh, uh, Return of the King, there's a lot more CGI. The fights get bigger, the fights get badder, you know, so I expect that to happen. And I, I do think... That's why the fellowship stands out. Obviously, too, I mean, it is the starting of the journey. It's when we're meeting these characters. It's when they're fighting these, you know, small bands of orcs, and it's real. And it, it just looks really good. Yeah, and let's not forget, too, that they only go over as much of the story as we need to know. Like, I had no idea that Gandalf was supposed to be a different race entirely, he wasn't human. He's he's something completely different. But I had no idea watching these movies, but that didn't detract from the film itself. In fact, it didn't it felt like the film was wasn't muddled just enough if that makes sense. We get the opening with Galadriel telling us a brief history of the ring and then it starts. Yeah, and how great is just that brief history of the ring, right? The opening of the film is one of the best ever. I mean, it's so good. Her voice and everything sets the tone and the scene, and then the Hobbit soundtrack plays in the background once the once we go to the Shire, and it separates what had happened to what's currently happened, and the film merges into this really dark world really well. Exactly how I read it, merging by Tolkien when we were talking about like this ring was finally it finally reached a point where it started to corrupt the world again and that's what it feels like with you know our our beloved Shire and we fall in love with it almost instantly in the film you know with the birthday party and the fireworks and uh Merry and Pippin and Gandalf and the whole beginning of the film uh Man, it's well done. Right, it's so it's so colorful. It's so um provincial. You're you're in a small town. Everyone knows each other. I like less of half than you than <laughs> the yeah. speech. That always cracks me up because I feel like that line kind of hints at a, a darker story that's about to happen. He's basically telling these people, I don't really like you. I've never liked you. And I'm leaving the Shire because of it. No one leaves the Shire. But you know I what? Know. Bilbo's leaving. Yeah, and <laughs> man, it it's just one of my absolute favorite films because the, uh, you know, I was reading a really great article uh, by The Telegraph, and it was actually written at the end of last year about what made Fellowship of the Rings 
so good, you know? And uh, one of the bigger points that uh, Alan Laidlaw makes in this article by The Telegraph saying that Fellowship gave birth to a new wave of fantasy genre filmmaking. And it's true. I mean, if you go and, uh, of course, after I read this, I went and started researching like fantasy films. And, you know, you had things like Labyrinth and, you know, these Jim Henson movies that, that kind of live in that same vein. But Lord of the Rings made it mainstream. And that's something I wanted to ask you, Kristen. I mean, what do you think? So you brought up a really great point. It tells us what we need to know. And the balance is struck almost perfectly between people that will really want to know, like the, the in-depth uh, Salmarillion stuff that's going on in Lord of the Rings. And then there are people that don't even know what the story is or where it goes or not even interested in fantasy at all. As a filmmaker, how hard do you think that is to do to sit in a room? And obviously, this this group of people that are making Lord of the Rings are obsessed with the you know the story. They're lovers of the story. All this stuff. It's got to be hard to strike that balance, right? How do you find a team where and and what are the questions you have to craft? Right? Does this matter to the story of the ring? I guess is the big one. Can you still tell the story of the ring without knowing Gandalf's history? Yes, yes, you can. Do you need Tom Bombadil? I would argue yes, <laughs> but I understand, right? You can cut out the scene of Tom Bombadil and the story of the ring still happens. It's not a necessity. It's a wonderful, wonderful moment, but I guess you don't need it. And you're right. How hard must that have been? How hard do you think everyone fought for certain scenes? I mean, is there something that was cut that you would have just tooth and nail fought to keep? I think the Tom Bombadil thing is the main argument with Fellowship of the Ring. I think a lot of people wanted to see that that interaction happen. Uh, me too. And I think it's also a credit to the filmmakers because they're, uh, people are saying, oh, I wish we got to see this part because the rest of it was so good. And I would have loved to see this be so good. Uh so I don't I don't take that necessarily as a negative thing. Would I have liked to see it? Yes. Would I, you know, uh, do I miss it? Yes. Did it ruin the film? Hell no. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think that you got to progress the story along. And already the film in its cut version is like two and a half hours. And then in the extended version, it's like three and a half hours. So, I mean, it's insane. Okay. And I want to ask you your thoughts on this because... Throughout, there's an extended scene in the second movie, and I know we didn't, we didn't, this isn't part of the book club today, but there's an extended scene in the second movie that brought up this thought, and it's a point where basically the characters are standing around a Tolkien map of Middle-earth. Basically, they're follow the camera's following the fingers as they point to the cities, of so they're kind of telling you where everything is, but in the first movie... I feel like they don't really give you a map. They just simply put you in the world and let your imagination take over so you can build the map in your own head as to where everyone's going. Did you like that? Did you think it detracted or added to? Do you think that was a necessary cut or maybe there should have been a map scene? I do, and this is probably one of my bigger issues with the film. I do think that it detracts from the film. I do think that the sense of journey is um what's the word that i'm looking for it is uh hindered by the fact that they don't explain some things so for example uh at the very beginning of the film gandalf says i need to go to uh i need to research what this is so i'm going to gondor brb gets on a horse rides his ass all the way to gondor so people that are watching this movie for the first time, they're like, oh, yeah, he just went around the corner, you know? The, the, the elapsed time is not given to the audience very well at that very scene. He goes in, does the research, rides back. We're supposed to imagine it's like some days later. In reality, it takes the Fellowship of the Ring three films to get to Gondor. Now, I know they're on horseback. I know they run into problems. I know all this and that and the other. 
but still Gandalf gets there real fast and then he gets to uh see Saruman real fast and like the the whole village of Bree scene you know Sam and Frodo are walking to Bree and they're supposed to meet Gandalf there well Gandalf jumps on a horse gets all the way to Isengard talks to Saruman comes all is supposed to come all the way back to Bree in the amount of time it takes them to walk there so like uh, that kind of stuff in the books it it takes more time obviously they describe every single blade of grass in the books but uh you know what i'm saying well i understand the importance of every blade of grass having a name right you can't <laughs> populate middle earth unless the spirits of the grass have names but i totally get what you're saying so in that stance do you think it would have been acceptable to at least drive home the direction they're headed? So kind of like in the game Diablo 2, you kind of have a map, but not really. But the direction you're always told is what east. You're always heading east. So regardless of where you are on this map that you don't really see, you know the direction you're headed. So do you think something like that maybe would have made up for... I think it would have heightened the stakes, right? I think if the audience knows, the audience that hasn't read the, the book or looked at a Lord of the Rings map before ever, uh, I don't think they drive home enough. They, they drive home the fact that this is dangerous, really dangerous. But part of the danger is how far away it actually is and what is in between them. So when they're on the mountain and they're talking about, uh, you know, going into the mines of Moria or going over this mountain or going through the Gap of Rohan, like all of these places that we don't know as, you know, uh, Un, uninformed film watchers, right? If they had maybe even in Rivendell, like thrown out a map and been like, all right, it's going to take us X amount of time to get to here on foot and X amount of time to get to here on foot, the audience might be like, oh shit, that's like a really long time you like to walk these places and stuff. So I, uh, I don't know. I think I think it might have heightened it a little bit. Although I do feel the tension and I do feel all of the things that I should feel. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, and oh, okay. So one one final one final thought on this before we go on to the, oh, I, we both have cover power here. Oh, so good. Um, do you think maybe artistically it's playing into Sam hitting as far as he's gone away from the Shire? And then once he crosses that threshold, it honestly doesn't matter because he's got nothing to compare it to at that point. So through his eyes, we've got nothing to compare it to at that point. And if that was purposeful, maybe it was a really cool decision. Oh, wow. What a great thought. Yeah, I never thought of that. I mean, it's it's very true. And, you know, uh, Sam says that line, you know, if I take one more step, Mr. Frodo, it's the farthest away from home that I've ever been. And Frodo, I mean, there's also another layer in there. Frodo's like, Sam, what are you talking about? This is going to be like a five second journey. Come on, buddy. Let's go. Remember what Gandalf said? Just, you know, put one foot in front of the other and we're going to get there eventually. And in the end, it's Sam who has to push Frodo <laughs> to keep going. How ironic. All right, so map talk aside, let's move into power and how it's portrayed in this film. What's your favorite moment of power? I love, and you, you talk about this a little later in the show notes too, I love the ring rates. I think that they're... Uh, my overall thought with power in this film is that it is distributed so well where the ring rates are not all powerful beings. They have flaws. Gandalf. And now a lot of people like, you know, watch this and they think, well, he's a wizard. What the heck is he doing? Like, why doesn't he just do something about what's going on? And, you know, uh, there's always talk about uh, the Eagles and why didn't they just like hop on an Eagle and just, get there right like if Gandalf could do that what the heck but uh the distribution of power in this is so good and you know the hobbits are powerful in their own way because they can withstand the ring the humans are physically powerful but they can't withstand the power of the ring the ring wraiths are drawn to the power and that is their downfall because they have 
have a other mission in, in their own life, I should say, than is to just, you know, find these rings and do whatever. And obviously it blinds them enough to where they can get run over by, by water. The wizards aren't super powerful in this. You know, Sauron is not even immortal in this. It's just great. Mm, and how do you like the fact that when the wizards are dueling, because this I think is one of the coolest parts, there are no, there's no flash. There's no pizzazz. We don't have little lasers shooting out of their staffs. We don't have ex fireworks exploding out of their fingertips. It's simply a really <laughs> focused, concentrated, bassy fight where it's the these invisible forces are coming at one another in ways that are terrifying to these two people. Yeah, I got a story about this wizard battle. I remember seeing it in the theater, and uh, I was in high school, and seeing it in the theater. Was I in high school? Yeah, I must have been. Uh, and I remember people laughing during this wizard battle because they thought it was funny that these two guys were like beating the crap out of each other and you know uh at the one part where um saruman is spinning gandalf around in a circle and stuff and it made me so mad i will never forget that because i had read the book and i was you know like what and like the people i was with were laughing at what was happening i was like this is this is real this and i still believe this this is classic D and D fantasy right you cannot constantly be hurling fireballs you cannot be constantly freezing people in ice cubes i mean we are uh built up like this because of video games and things like that but this classic fantasy of wizards that are just more in tuned with be it nature or the evil aspects of the world that is cool to me because it's more real and I never forgave those kids, and I never talked to them again. <laughs> <laughs> that is freaking hilarious, Jeff. Oh my gosh. Snob. Lord of the Rings snob. I love it. I love it. Okay, now, as you've gotten older, have you come to see the humor in that scene at all? Because as I've grown, I've come to see the seriousness and the awesomeness in that but I giggled when I first saw it. I'm not going to lie, you know, because I didn't read the books and I hadn't really played D&D &D at that point. So I didn't really understand the the sheer weight that they give this wizard battle or the ring. Like, for instance, when back earlier when Gandalf and, and Frodo drops the ring on the ground and it just hits. It's a thud. And then the ring is talked about as being sentient, like... To me, watching it for the first time, I really had to kind of stretch my imagination for that. But the more I've really gotten into to fantasy, high fantasy lore, and seen more representations of this, the more I understand just how, how amazing they really handled it. But yeah, yeah. but there is a silliness to it. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> Now, now, were you? Did you nerd out when uh, when Saruman got the two staffs, and he was dual wielding? Yeah. Do you think he was he was dual wielding? Do you think he could attune himself really quickly to Gandalf's? <laughs> he he picked up a noose bag, dual wielding staffs. Right. And he could, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and it shows. Man, the best thing about this film, in my opinion, is the casting and the writing in order to show the progression of these characters and their character arcs because every single character in this film has a solid character arc even saruman at that moment where you see him and he i don't truly believe that he is super convinced until gandalf comes and says yeah we're doing this we're putting it in the hands of a hobbit and then Saruman, in my mind, he starts thinking, what? Like, that's what we're going to do? We can't do that. We should just join up. Like, I've been thinking about this for a long time. We're going to join up. I've seen it. I've already kind of dabbled in this idea of what should happen. Follow me. And then Gandalf's arc is, I mean, one of the best in the film, too. You know what I'm saying, though? Every single one of these characters is insanity. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. And even from the, the smallest, even Bilbo Baggins kind of has an arc, right? When we see him in the beginning, he disappears, and we see him again at um, the Elven City, where he scares me every time. Every time I gotta amp myself up. But, but you know, that's one of those special moments you'll never forget. And maybe that's why the first one is so endearing to us, is because... The other two movies have great characters and other characters that have incredible arcs. I mean, I love the Faramir and Faramir's father, that kind of thing. But this first one is so concise and it stays focused on, though a large group of people, it's a relatively small group of people. And because of that, even though Boromir joins up halfway through the film, even he has this incredible story that he gets to go through. He even has a redemption at the end. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, these these may be fighting words for a lot of people out there. I don't know your thoughts on this, Kristen, but I think that Boromir, and I'm saying it with conviction, is the best character in the series. In the films, in the book, I love him. I think he is the best because he's flawed, because he would die for his king. At that moment at the end, it's like, my God, what an awesome, awesome dude. Like the story and he's bad, but he's good and he's corrupted. And it shows us what humans, even good humans that are willing to go to this council and fight with the other races and, and get in there and, and, you know, get nitty gritty. At the end, he realizes what he did and it's so good. And, oh man, I, I honestly think that he is the best character in the whole series. That's fantastic. So if you were to play one character in this entire film theory, or film theory, <laughs> in this entire film, Boromir's your choice. Absolutely. He's, he's so real, right? Imagine yourself sitting there. Wait a minute. If I actually take that ring, then I think I can end this war. And I would be all powerful. Probably have a bunch of money, a bunch of chicks, you know, like all this stuff is like building up, it's real, and it corrupts him, but not enough, but just a little bit. And there are those moments where he picks up the ring in the snow and you're on the edge of your seat thinking, is this guy gonna do something? And then he doesn't, and you're like, boom, what an awesome character. I love him, I think he's so good. Right, and I think of all of the characters, Boromir really speaks to what's left out of the film. Because behind Boromir's character, is so much story, so much rich, realistic emotion. He's got a father who favorited him. He's got a little brother who he loves, but his father doesn't love. Lost his mother at a young age. They're on Gondor, which is bordering up against Mordor. So they've seen, they've seen the terrible things that have been going on for the past few generations. Osgiliath is still being fought over on the river. I mean, so, so once you learn all that, it makes his character even better. And even going into the film without having read the books, you fall in love with him. He, that, there's a reason he was memed so much and is still one of the faces of the Lord of the Rings when you look up the things that people remember about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I agree with you. There's a lot of backstory there that this is the definition of a film that you can't understand watching one time. You can't fully understand it. You have to really, really study it and really, you know, learn about the lore and all of that. And knowing about the steward of Gondor, how Gondor has no king, how how uh, Aragorn slash Strider is the king of Gondor. And Boromir knows that. And Boromir knows that this whole thing is... You know, but he's pissed at him for not being there because there's a battle on their front lines. And this wizard is saying, we're going to take this ring by foot and the hobbit's going to carry it. And Boromir's like, no, listen to me. I'm there. I know what's happening. You don't. You haven't seen it. We are going to do this, that, and the other. You know, oh, oh man, his character drives that story. And I think it is really, really, really good. Heck, yes. Now, what are your thoughts on the portrayal of the elves? Because I think with the elves, I often come across the most black and white stance on the elves. <laughs> you either love them or you hate them. There's, there's little gray area. Yeah, I'm not a huge 
uh you know a lot there are a lot of people out there that really enjoy like elf lore in any sort of high fantasy or even fantasy for that matter you know going into dungeons and dragons that kind of stuff elves i never really lean towards that uh sort of play style right whenever i'm playing a game like that i do think that the the i think there's two there's obviously two different kinds of elves in this film but i think that the galadriel kind of feel of being corrupted and being like all powerful and crazy is awesome the part that i think i have a hard time and always have with struggling is she gets pissed and then she says you know what i need to i need to take a boat i need to get out of here Right, because, you know, I need to go with my people, and that was a bad thing that I just did. But she and... passed her test! <laughs> yeah. She got an I A+. Mean, plus. Just, I, it just makes me think, and I know that it's all... I, I've read up on it and thought about it, and it, it's just not my, for lack of a better word, play style. You know, like, I love that she goes crazy, and, you know, what would it have been like if the elves, like, joined up at that moment and Galadriel led the charge, you know... All that kind of stuff uh, is funny. What are your thoughts? My my thoughts is that the more I watch it, the more I I get them, because and and it, I think it's because elves are like robots. You have directors and you have actors that can really pull off that subtle emotion, like um, Elrond, right? Fantastic, amazing, and I even think Galadriel. That performance is incredible. But then you get the younger actors, and they're really trying, but it comes off more robotic. So, so there's not that underlying emotion that, that's easy to connect to. Which is interesting because Orlando Bloom, right, Legolas, my sister really had a crush on him, and I just, I was like, but he's such a, a flimsy little thing, and he doesn't feel anything. But watching Orlando Bloom redo that role in The Hobbit, series he did an amazing job i mean he's clearly really progressed as an actor and i would love to see older orlando bloom now in that role but but i can see what he was trying to do there and this leads to this cool thing you've written with casting 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 your favorite and then your least favorite in the film yeah so i mean it's it's easy to put it to uh, pick a part of film that you love so much, right? To try to figure out, you know, what it is about it that you, that you love so much. I think as far as casting goes, obviously, Sir Ian McKellen is amazing as Gandalf. I mean, it, it's exactly what I read growing up. It's exactly what I what I thought. The little nuances and the jokes and the the peaks and the valleys. And there are times where you know Gandalf is having he has emotional conflict, but then he lets the the viewers rest when there are times where he makes jokes or, you know, he's not a one note character. He's very uh, dynamic. And then on the other end of that, I, I think my least favorite portrayal in the film is actually Frodo. I think that I never read Frodo so whiny. And I think that in the book, he's super, uh, or in the film, I should say, he's super whiny. And especially in this one, you know, and I, I get it. He's scared and he, this is not his thing. And I, I get all of that. But as you know, Kristen, I have a problem with people that are just, uh, that characters that are just uh, consistently angry, angsty, sad, or whiny. And I feel like Frodo in this film kind of, kind of, falls into that category and the others pick him up and i mean i'm that's the film though right right he's the innocent that gets corrupted by the ring so maybe innocence was played too heavy and even scott johnson responded to what's your favorite part with sam sam <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah it's it, he is dynamic because at the beginning of the film he's happy but then once they hit brie and you know it starts to hit the fan the rest of the film it's it's pretty uh it's pretty one note after that for me but everybody else falls in that 
really good category for me. Like their character arcs and, you know, Aragorn, uh, Legolas even is conflicted at a lot of things. And, you know, uh, Gimli is conflicted in Minds of Moria. And it's just, it's very, uh, it's good. Yeah, yeah. And I love that uh, Aragorn, I always feel like he didn't get to have as much fun as everybody else. But not because of not because of Viggo Mortensen. His performance is amazing, but just because the character. <laughs> He's got so much weight riding on his poor shoulders that everyone's getting a hoop doop around. Gimli gets some funny scenes. Legolas gets some funny scenes. Aragorn gets to smile at him when they go on some bro adventures. <laughs> I mean, Aragorn, yeah, I feel and I was thinking about this the other day when we, uh, a while back now, man, it's got to be, what, six months when we played Divinity 2, a long time ago, and we're playing, and uh, Kyle Ferguson was playing in our party, and at the very beginning of the game takes like leadership talents right and when you take these leadership talents they don't do a whole lot at the beginning of of the game or a game like this and then as you progress your leadership gets stronger and you're able to affect your party more and you're able to build this relationship with people and and you know it's portrayed really well in that rpg divinity 2 and so in this i equated it to the same type of thing right aragorn is coming into this with one point of leadership. And he shows that one point of leadership when they're talking to the council in Rivendell. And then it's just building and building. And then at the end, he becomes the the king, right? I mean, it's crazy. Oh, dude, it's amazing. And talking about that buildup, I want to give it to the filmmakers because how many times were we told about something before we actually saw it? I mean, the ring, we don't know it's the ring until Gandalf comes back later and tosses it into the fire. We hear about the ring wraiths, the, the corrupted men in the beginning story, but we don't see what they've become until later. Uh, the, the cave troll. Thaglis mentions they have a cave troll, but cave troll shows up 10 minutes later. And then the Balrog, we see some fire and we hear some stuff, but we don't actually see this thing until it's freaking right there. And I think these setups just really drive the story because the designers created these things that were so much cooler than I personally could have ever imagined them to be. Absolutely. I mean, the whole shadow and flame aspect, building it up before the Balrog comes in. I mean, I, I loved it so much that, uh, you know, the super geeky stuff. Like, I bought a miniature of the Balrog, put it together, painted it. I love that creature. It is so cool. And the lore behind it and the fact that Gandalf stands up to it to save the party. And then, you know, it ultimately, spoiler alert, um, it, takes him on his journey as a wizard and all this stuff oh yeah very well said i think you you said it perfectly all right and then you have here relationships the reason we go to the movies so what are your thoughts with that yeah i mean it's it's think about it i i was thinking about this as i was watching it you know the relationship between i mean the most obvious relationships are frodo gandalf frodo sam Frodo, Boromir, you know, so there are moments where, and this is just great filmmaking in my mind, where Frodo and Gandalf are sitting and Gandalf's trying to decide which one of the three doors to go in in the Mines of Moria. And he says his quote to Frodo about, you know, life, basically, like just this quote. And you see that it hits Frodo and you see it. And then they play that again after Gandalf dies in like a flashback, right, uh, of this whole thing. That's a relationship worth going to the movies for. When you go to a film and you think it's good, the most likely reason is because there are relationships that raise the stakes, that make the, the film worth watching, in my opinion. So even if you go to, you know... Silly movies like, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, right? And so you're you're out there and you're watching, uh, you know, Captain Jack Sparrow and he, he doesn't care about anybody, right? Well, no, he actually does. And that's the part where it's the relationship that we have with this character where we think he doesn't care about anybody. But then when he does care about somebody, you're like, 
oh and that's why that's what makes really good moments like that flashback of gandalf and frodo so i just wrote this in here because i was thinking you know boromir talking to aragorn i could talk about this all day when he says i would have gone with you to the end my king the whole time the whole film you're thinking this guy is like heartless but is he but isn't he but is he and then at the end there's a redemption and you're like oh hell yeah it's so good right and it doesn't feel forced it's a real relationship i absolutely 100 100 believe boromir saying that he means it he totally means it he knows he messed up and he he atoned as best as he could and here it is on the table so of all of the relationships in this film what's the one you love the most if you had to pick one if you had to have a relationship in this film yourself yeah if i had to have that type of feel i mean i think sam's really doesn't shine through until the end of the series you know at this point that sam's gonna do whatever it takes even drowning in the river before he you know he can't swim but he's gonna stick with frodo to, to, to the whole thing um but i wouldn't pick that i i do think that it sets the story up so well, Boromir's relationship with the party, Boromir's relationship with Aragorn and everything. It sets the stakes again that I think that that would be my favorite. That is just so good and and just, it's great. It's beautiful. It is, it's, yeah, I, I agree. All right, who's, so favorite character, we know it's Boromir. Now, if you have to go with a non-human character, who's your favorite? oh that's so good uh, that's such a great question uh you know this about me Kristen, but for some reason i always lead in toward humans when i play like you know any sort of role-playing game or anything i don't know why because they're flawed and i like that um so other races like uh, elves for example you know i i don't need to worry about walking on snow because i can just walk on top of it because i'm so light-footed and then you see you know aragorn carrying three hobbits on his back trudging through snow what legolas pick up one of these hobbits bro like you're walking on top of the snow but then it would pull him down into the snow jeff <laughs> he can't get his little elf, elf feet wet <laughs> you know so, you ever thought uh, about elves for once in your life <laughs> also though if we go into two towers my favorite characters are all the humans like the would you call them rohinians the, i don't know well, maybe, right? I know the plural for the riders is the Roharim, so maybe that applies to all of them. But I like yeah, Rohinians. So, I love that word, but Roharim, yeah. I think, is... We coined it right here, and, you know, Tolkien is doing this in his grave. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I love them into the... The Gondorians in the third film. I mean, I, I love the humans, but if I had to pick somebody that wasn't, I really, I like Gimli. I like the the comedic, you know, aspect that he he adds to, to the tale. I like the Balrog. If I was going to pick, you know, a character that is not human, that, you know, is just a badass. What about you? Oh man, favorite, I'm Gimli, right? Every time I see Gimli, I realize I would probably have a lot of fun RPing as a dwarf, but I never do <laughs> because the aesthetic doesn't really appeal to me. But I think next time, next time that's what I'll do. So Gimli, he's because he's probably one of my favorite side character progressions. He gets funnier as the movies go on. Yeah, for sure. All right, now I've got I've got a question for you, and there doesn't need to be an answer, but it was a thought I had. The story is about failure, ultimately, because Frodo fails. Spoiler alert! <laughs> We're a little past the point of no return here. It's kind of hard to talk about the single movie without bringing in the entire rest of it, but Frodo can't get rid of the ring in fact he puts it on and he's gonna leave if it were for Smeagol biting the finger off and falling into the lava Boromir can't resist the ring and because of that he dies so what are your thoughts on this that there's so much failure but ultimately through this there's a grand victory because not everyone fails, right? Aragorn says no. Galadriel says no. Gandalf says no. 
Yeah. Well, I hadn't thought about this until I read it in the show notes, but I mean, talking about failure, it even goes back to the 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 previous age, right? When uh when they fail, like they fail and they don't even know it. When the king takes the ring off of Sauron's, you know, dusty old hand and keeps it instead of destroying it, he fails because he could have fixed it. I mean, it's failure throughout the entire thing. But if you think about it, the main line through line of this story is nothing but failure, but everything and draven in the, in the chat has a really good point it's victory through failure because everything else that's happening around that main failure line is all success right if you think about it it always comes down to you know we've got to unite these people even gandalf dying becomes a success the battle of helm's deep the battle of gondor like doing all these fighting raising the army of the dead doing all this crazy stuff is just success after success after success building up to the ultimate failure and then you know the film i mean you're right if it wasn't for gollum which what are your thoughts on that because i think that is absolutely ingenious the fact that in the end no one could destroy the ring no like, it's you really... greed yeah yeah it's it's hard because i really feel for sam he just wants to kill golem straight up and then you don't have to worry about it but without letting this horrid twisted little creature live we don't have ultimate victory in the end. We don't have an evil, what we would consider an evil emotion, actually winning the day for everybody. And and I know Frodo, though I like to imagine that Frodo sees himself in Smeagol, and that's why Frodo can't really. Because also Smeagol's the only one who understands what Frodo's hearing and, and feeling and suffering through. So... It's that, that yin and the yang as Frodo slowly falls. And, uh, ugh, I'm, yeah, I, I don't really have words to describe my emotions regarding that. I think it's brilliant. And I love the fact that it's that, that greed that wins over in the end. But Absolutely. Oof. And, you know, they could have ended the, the book, you know, it, it could have ended with, you know, Gollum getting there and Frodo and Gollum having like a, big you know fisticuffs fighting each other eventually frodo throws Gollum into the fire after he throws him into the fire he looks at sam and he says sam we did it and flips the ring into the fire and the ring blows up and then the whole thing is is over right i mean that's how a lot of hollywood stories might end right you know just kind of like with this big fight in the end or you know whatever but it ends with failure which is so good i mean i i love it it's great yeah and not not one that feels bad either i mean you you feel depressed i've i really felt hurt betrayed even when frodo said he couldn't do it but the way it plays out there's heart there i think a lot of a lot of heart there all right, well, thank you for going on that question. That, I, that's one that could be written about for ages, I think. But we had some great Twitter responses, and I'm going to try and warp these into questions for you, Jeff. So Beard Howard says, I love everything about this movie. Quotes, keep it secret, keep it safe. My question here for you is, what's your favorite quote from Fellowship? Oh, it's the bore. I mean, this is like a <laughs> Boromir love fest says. for me. Yeah. <laughs> But it's the end, obviously. I would have gone with you to the end, my king. But if I didn't pick that, it would definitely... I mean, it's up there with You Shall Not Pass. It's up there with Fly You Fools, which I never knew what he said in the film forever. Like, as Gandalf is dangling there, I thought he said, like, follow your fruits or something. <laughs> I don't I don't know. As I was growing up, I had no idea what the hell he was saying. So uh, that's a great line. Uh, there's so much. There's so much Bo bilbo's line that you talked about at the beginning of the of the film is great mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we had scott johnson sam thornbrow writes because the filmmakers do such an amazing job of communicating the sheer weight of it all there's a ring of course but that tiny piece of otherworldly metal is far heavier and costs so much more than anyone can realize yet they somehow make you feel that through the screen 
So what was the moment you felt that? And I, I wonder, did you feel it immediately? Because having read the books, you knew from the get-go where this all was going. Absolutely. I think if you were to watch it uh, without any knowledge, I think you would start feeling it when you start seeing how it's affecting Bilbo. And Thorne has a really good point here because this is what drives this film. You talked about it. The sound design, even down to the sound design, when the ring hits the ground, it sounds like a ton of metal hitting the ground because it's that heavy, right? It's that heavy of a burden to carry all the way to Mordor. The fact at the very beginning of the film that Gandalf freaks out when Frodo offers him the ring because he knows what it's going to be. I mean, Thorin has said it so well here that somehow it's movie magic, but we feel this from the beginning, when the first 20 minutes of this movie were in and sold for three films. Right, and then um, one of my favorite parts tied to that is when G Gandalf gets back to Frodo and they chuck the fire into the ring. Uh, he pulls it out, gives it to Frodo, and we see Gandalf's face as Frodo saying, oh, nothing's happening, it's just a ring, and then the switch. There is, there is writing, and it's lighting up Frodo's face as he's looking at it. And, and Gandalf's emotional turn there sells it 100%. It's a beautiful, beautiful moment. So good. And then Mouse Divided wrote, The incredible filming locations. I swear that New Zealand is basically Middle Earth. So from that, Jeff, what is your favorite location in Fellowship? Oh, man. Probably the one place that they didn't film in New Zealand, I don't think. But the Mines of Moria are just daunting, right? They're, I mean, when Gandalf says it's going to take, you know, I forget how many days, he says. But it's days for them to get from one side to the other. And they're walking through these cavernous, you know, giant places. But I think that if I had to pick an outdoor location, it would be, I mean the shire you you don't feel for the shire unless you love the way that it looks and you love the the aesthetic of the shire and like how great it is and you just want to live there i want to just have you know pints of beer and walk around and shoot off fireworks and you know have the worst thing about my day be that my relatives might come over i mean that sounds awesome right it's so comfy they don't really have to worry about much and then you get <laughs> to talk about, you, about the weird ones that leave me, um, I really like Rivendell a lot. I, I love that fall feel to it. And then I guess they're singing in the background the whole time. And it's a pretty chill place if it weren't for all the elves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're leaving soon anyway. So, you know, you could just inherit the land and there it is. And then That'd I came up with some questions for you, Jeff, just two this time. Which of the ringwraiths would you be? Man, is the... Uh... And it can be because they do something at some point that you enjoy. Because mine is the one when they're fighting Aragorn on top of the ruins. And he gets a torch to the face. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the one I want to be. he kind of looks back. He kind of <laughs> looks back like, oh, I got a torch on my face. And then he turns and he's like, you guys still there? Yep, you're still there. Okay. I want to keep... <laughs> yeah, I like that guy. I also like how the... Uh... The ring rates, they got zero Fs to give, right? When they're like, give up the Hobbit, she elf. Like, I, I love that scene. I just think it's so, their voice is awesome. That guy's great. And then the, the poor, the poor, poor gatekeeper at uh, in the village of Bree, uh, he didn't feel much when he went, but uh, he went by the giant door being smashed in by, <laughs> by a ring rate. So that's you, Jeff, just smashing the door down with your kick butt horse. That's uh, right. Man, those right. horses are great. Right, with the blood coming down the hooves and their armor and they're these night black steeds, sometimes with red eyes. That's so an good. undead mount right there, if I've ever seen one. Okay, and now we're switching from a ring wraith to a wizard. You're an all-powerful wizard in this universe. 
What's a simple thing that frustrates you more than it should? Like when Gandalf can't remember the password to the Mines of Moria, he is so, so upset in that moment. What's a simple thing you would forget that would drive you nuts? You know, not just forgetting. I, I think that... Uh... One of the things that always boggles my mind about wizards, right, is the line that Saruman says to Gandalf when he says, Your love of the halfling's weed has driven you to forgetfulness, or whatever. I would have looked at Saruman and been like, I'm a wizard! What are you talking about? If I, if I want to smoke the... If I want to smoke the hobbit's herb, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the one thing that would drive me crazy. Like... I'm a wizard. <laughs> right, I've been alive for how long? I'm going to be forgetful regardless of this hobbit herb. The yeah. hobbit herb, I think. <laughs> That's funny. All right, and if you liked Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, of course, I would suggest to you the Two Towers and Return of the King. If you want to read more about it, read the books, read The Silmarillion, because that gives a really cool backstory to the whole thing. And I would say read the book, The Hobbit book, because the book itself is actually pretty fun. And finally, play Dungeons & Dragons, the tabletop game, because this, this is the thing that inspired Dungeons & Dragons. This is where it all started. For sure. I mean... Ugh, it, it is it, it is to a T. If you're if you're looking to branch off a little bit and get some other stories that have similar you know journeys, endless journeys, this kind of feel. Uh, the Harry Potter series is is another good one that has you know this this never ending journey of failure that ends up to be a success in the end. Spoiler alert. Um, also, I think this this film does not get enough credit, and it kind of falls in line with this sort of tale. And that's the 2017 Jungle Book film. Film uh, that film is so good, and it's the one that has the live action Mowgli, but everything else is uh, computer generated, even down to the scenery and everything. I mean, this little kid was acting basically on a green screen, and uh, it's a it's the same type of feel of this magical journey. And what makes that magical is obviously the the talking animals. So check that out. Awesome, and then you have Pan's Labyrinth here as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth is also, you know, living in that, that same theme, I would say. Yeah, just don't expect a happy ending with Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, it's a beautiful alert. film. I totally agree. <laughs> Watch it if you haven't, but whew, be ready. All right. Fellowship of the Rings, you think it's going to stand the test of time? It's already stood up for, what, 18 years now? 19, 17 years? <laughs> Yeah, and I tweeted this out earlier in the week when I had watched it multiple times this week. I can watch this movie constantly. I, I think that uh, out of all of the other Lord of the Rings film, this one will stand up the most. And it will stand the test of time for sure. I mean, it has united geeks around the world. I mean, to... Create to content creators to create more films like this. Like we talked about that quote from the uh, from the uh, Telegraph earlier about how it opened up a new fantasy genre for filmmaking. You know the practical effects are amazing in this. The cast is amazing. The relationships are amazing. The storytelling is awesome. It is simply complex. And what I mean by that is like the story is simple in a way. We got to take this thing to this place or the world is going to end. But on top of that, you add Tolkien's entire complexity and how complex it is, is what makes it amazing. And they're going to be showing this in film schools forever. I mean, I, I think the force perspective, the, the practical effects again, hell yeah. Beautiful. I love that term, simple complexity. That's beautiful. Or simply complex is what you said, but yeah, fantastic. All right, Jeff. What's next? Next, we're kind of, we're, we're veering a little bit here next, and I'm excited for this. So we're watching the classic Gone with the Wind, which you can find on Amazon Prime. I know a lot of people out there may not have seen this classic film, but man, oh man, this inspires a lot of the stuff you love. I guarantee it. So uh, get out there on Amazon Prime, watch Gone with the Wind. It's not super long. <laughs> but <laughs> Wait, uh compared to the extended edition lord of the rings yeah. you're looking at a pretty <laughs> short movie here 
that's what I was gonna say. Um, but yeah, uh, check it out. We can't wait to talk about it. We really want to hear your thoughts on what you think about this this film. Yeah, and I would say it stands the test of time. It's an epic in the way that all good epics are, all timeless epics are. The characters, like we talked about in this film, the characters and their relationships with one another really keep this thing alive. First time I saw it was back in college. And you know, sometimes with old movies, it's a hit or a miss, but this one floored me. Floored yeah, it's me. very good. I think it was the dresses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but if you want to share your thoughts about gone with the wind coming up i'll be tweeting out monday what you love about gone with the wind uh over at tpa cast or you can email us at talking pictures alliance at gmail.com jeff where can people find you you can find me on twitter you can follow me i'm at mr jeff reynolds all one word but we're talking a lot about a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> all the time especially battle for azeroth that's your big thing coming up are you gonna tweet live updates no ain't nobody got time for tweeting while while i'm trying to get to 120 what if they integrate twitter into they th i think they have for achievements i think if you get achievements uh, yeah so I'll, I'll set that up if you want to follow my achievements all the way through the the wee small hours of the morning then uh I'll set it up. <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right, if you're looking for me, you can find me at underscore Kristen Ashton underscore Twitter, Twitch, Instagram. And as for this show, you can find us right here on twitch.tv slash Dream Destroyer every other Sunday for more movie madness. We're taking a big a bit of a break this time. We'll be back September 9th, actually. I've got family coming into town. We've got Battle for Azeroth to play. So September 9th, we'll be back with Gone with the Wind right here. And if you'd like to support this podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash tpacast. All right, Jeff, final words. You shall not pass.